So John, uh, John Cheatham's for, uh, we're fortunate to have John here uh, to uh, learn from him, and we're excited for uh, a number of talks he's going to give today, and uh, we're going to start with his uh, first one, so John will take it away. Very good. Thank you, Mark, uh, and to Lee and uh, Eric uh, for inviting me. So uh, the title, I'm sure that Eric, I think, I mean, Eric, I think gave us all the titles, but I got to get there. So uh, the using transeptal techniques, um, uh, I thought that you needed a mnemonic for this meeting, so that's it. I'm a faculty member of TCCCSHDI. <laughs> all right, so. Yeah. So transeptal techniques for complex interventions, uh, you have to understand the atrial anatomy. If, the, if that's where your transeptal needle is going to go, you have to know what catheters and techniques. You have to go through the procedure in your mind. You always have to have plan B ready. Uh, and, uh, and as a rule, you should have blood in the room. Uh, again, uh, people talk about whether you give heparin or not before you do a transeptal puncture. Uh, depends on who you trained with, I guess. And then use any, any additional uh, image that makes the procedure safe for you. The standard transeptal technique uh, is commonly used to access the left heart. That's in, when I was in Houston training under Dr. Mullins. We weren't allowed to go retrograde. Everything was transeptal. If you're three kilos, it's transeptal. That's just the way it was back in those days, which was before Lee, I guess. So again, uh, for, for us, it was to get to the left side of the heart. But nowadays, you know, if you have contraindications, now commonly used for complex interventions. So if you want to do the intervention on the left side of the heart, you better be able to do the transeptal. Uh, and then, of course, now with the EP, uh, our colleagues in EP, you're very commonly called to the cath lab uh, to help uh, for various things. And I'll show some of those. The septal anatomy. Again, uh, the plane of the septum, and, and Zahid's going to talk about septal anatomy when he talks about devices, etc. Again, you need to understand it's a three-dimensional structure. Uh, we talk about how with the patient lying supine, how you, because we're going to use the needle uh, with the patient lying supine when we talk about four o'clock and three o'clock. The fossa valves, it's posterior and caudal to the aortic root and anterior free wall of the right atrium. Uh, the anatomy can be distorted if you have aortic or mitral valve disease, and the location of the puncture may be important depending on what you want to do. For instance, if you're doing a lot of mitral valve interventions, you want it at a specific spot uh, in the left atrium. You've got to be very familiar with the transeptal catheter system. There are different ones. Uh, again, if you can, uh, use the right femoral vein uh, because it's easier than the left femoral vein because you're crossing over to the IVC. It's a different uh, direction coming into the atrial septum. Again, know your transeptal system, but basically, you know, you have your flange on your needle and your sidearm or your sheath and realize those two things go together. And the other thing is, and I don't know why they did this, but for whatever reason, most manufacturers put this to where you put it over an 032 wire rather than the 035 wire you always have, and you're going to be there with an 035 wire and you're not going to be able to put the transeptal system over. In our world, in congenital, we have biplane typically, but most, uh, certainly adults, uh, labs do not, and it's more in a single plane. And again, um, I think, uh, and Eric and the people can correct me, a lot of times I see additional imaging used a lot of times in the single plane, particularly if you, if you have not got all the experience. And again, uh, the, the, you keep uh, everything together and you don't get the ne needle out. Everything is from the SVC, and of course you rotate it down the, to the fossa. And then you're around 4 o'clock when you, perf when you uh, uh, put the needle out. Uh, I was trained by Chuck, so we have the needle hooked to a pressure monitor. And I know that's not true for a lot of uh, places, but we typically were standard AP and lateral, not RAO, LAO, but I think it doesn't really make any difference. Uh, the reason we hooked it up to the atrial, uh, to the pressure, is as soon as we saw the pressure, we stopped with the needle. Uh, and you could tag as well. And again, you all have done transeptal, so once you're through, you know you just don't advance everything over the needle. You got to advance everything. That's why you turn it to three o'clock, so you have more room in the left atrium. And then, of course, the sheath is left in place and the introducer removed. It's very important, and I'm kind of reminded of this with my young colleagues. <clears throat> we didn't have all of the access uh, echoes and everything to help us, and so. All I said is, look, wh however you can do this procedure the most efficient and safely, you should do it that way. And if it's additional imaging to do transeptal, that's fine. Uh, I think that there's no, there's no hero badges at the end of the day. Uh, again, uh, in a single plane lab, particularly, uh, and if you're doing retrograde aortic catheter uh, in the aortic root, helps you give some orientation as well. Now, you need to know your choices. Lots of, lots of different transeptal uh, uh, materials. 
and uh, from different companies. We were trained on the Medtronic, a six French, eight French a pediatric and adult. The St. Jude system, which a lot of the EP people use, I don't, this particular is the transeptal, not the St. Jude agilis. And it's, to me, the dilator's too long uh, from, the, from the sheath. And, and you can go through the needle, but then you're in with the dilator very quick, so I don't particularly like it. Uh, the Bayless uh, system, uh, which has a transeptal kit using RF energy that, uh, that can be used as well. And, of course, they have the nickel and wire that we use for other things. And then this is one thing that you really need to keep and be good at, and that is using the Agilis sheath. Our EP guys really know how to do this. They come in three curves. It's, you know, steerable sheath, and you will use this all the time for different procedures that you're going to end up doing interventional as well. These are the choices. Again, you got lots of different kind of catheters from different companies. Just be familiar with the, with, we have all of them, but be familiar with the one that you uh, want to use. Complications from transeptal, you got to anticipate and you got to manage them. The cardiac perforation occurs somewhere between 1 and 3 percent, 1 percent in technically diagnostic and up to 3 percent in interventional. And of course, it's usually going to be the aortic or the atrial wall. Chuck always said, if it's on needle, don't worry. Uh, but if it's not, if it's more than needle, if it's dilator and sheath, you need to worry. Uh, again, that's when you have your surgeon uh, in the room because you're going to have pericardial fusion, et cetera, and you need to be ready. Systemic, systemic embolization doesn't occur too often, but again, flushing sheaths just like we do for everything is very important. IVC perforation is very rare, but cardiac arrhythmias can, can happen during the procedure as well. So I just wanted to go over real quick and give you some examples. So this is our kind of our typical high, uh, patient with hypoplastic left heart syndrome that had a near intact septum, and you can see atrial stenting, and this is the... the the uh, Lee Benson way of deploying stents with the sheath over there, as Eric will tell you, with coarctation uh, partially over. We found that's really nice. You can see the left atrium is not very big, so you don't have a big target. Uh, this is a 34-year-old recently referred uh, with hypertension, poor pulses. Had hypertension known in pregnancy, had a consult with the adult group. They referred to surgery, said that she refused, so she just got lost to follow-up. She referred to our adult team, our adult congenital team. Uh, she had an outside CT and said, hey, she's got severe coarctation with aneurysm, so she said to us, to team to fix. This was the CT scan, which is pretty awful looking, as you can see. And you can see what looks like aneurysms, and you can see severe uh, coarctation. <clears throat> and this is what it looked like with some of the still frames. So here we got all ready. Said, they said, John, I want you to do this. I want you to cover stents or grasp, blah, 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 and all this kind of stuff. Well, so the surprise, again, uh, we already put a left radial line because in case we needed to perforate the, the uh, if we covered the left subclavian. Uh, however, what we found was she had complete interruption, had the large vertebral artery actually filling um, the left subclavian retrograde, and they had huge collaterals which filled some of the aneurysm that looked on the CT. And then what access to get above the interruption? She's completely interrupted. Uh, she already had the left radio, but that wasn't a good place since that didn't communicate. Right radio was a very very good, and, Eric and the guys that are doing the radios all the time is easy. Again, transeptal uh, to help you. And of course, again, my mentor was Chuck, so that was a relatively easy thing for us to do. So this is with the trend. This is with the, the retrograde catheter, and you can see the transeptal that you had to go and go in the ascending aorta, and you see all these huge collaterals going down, and ultimately the collaterals end up filling. You'll see aneurysm here. It's not from the aorta. And then you get them close together, and just like you have different ways you can do perforation, uh, you can use a transeptal needle for this, you can use the RF, you can use stiff end of the wire, and just, uh, again, making the connection, and then after the covered stents in place. So again, we started off, though, using the transeptal in the usual manner. So this is a Fontan patient that, uh, that Darren was asked to come in because they had EP guys had to do a bunch of uh, uh, procedures, and you can see has a stent in place, has a cardi seal in place. So again, they said we needed you to get on the other side. This is actually the BMC uh, RF transeptal perforation. You can see the, the, the uh, needle, or the, not really the needle, the RF uh, uh, part of the catheter going through. Um, do you, is, how many use this particular system? It's, you're in Canada, so I guess, uh, yeah. Is this the Bayless system? Yeah, yeah, this is Bayless. Yeah. Yeah. Again, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we, we like it too, uh, you know, the transeptal uh, way. And, of course, again, this is just the agilis sheath in a very simple, uh, not curved at this point in time. But this helps us. This helps the EP team as well. Again, this is a complicated mustard repair. Uh, already has a covered stent in the SVC uh, baffle obstruction. And you can see the leads that were in place uh, and already had a covered stent. But we were asked to say, well, we need to get across the baffle. So, again, transeptal. Agilis sheath, 
curve so they can get their EP catheters wherever they want. So that's the kind of patients you're going to get called for transeptal many times. Here's another patient that comes in. You can see that it is not uncommon uh, severe SVC baffle obstruction. So you can perforate there and you can use any of the systems where it's a uh, RF, you can use the transeptal needle or you can use a stiff end of a wire. And that happened previously, so that, of course they never go away. I'll go back here. And so they come back a few years later with all their arrhythmias. So they said, well, we, we need you now to get across the baffle for us. And this is the kind of a PA angiogram, kind of giving people the outline. You'll notice no additional imaging. There's no TE, there's no ice catheter at this point in time, which you could use. And again, uh, afterwards, uh, after the transeptal puncture, you see there are lots of catheters in your way, uh, even in biplane. And ultimately, you get to the area where you uh, help the EP team uh, uh, with the Agilis steerable sheath. Just to, uh, to kind of emphasize, again, patients that are sent to you, this is a very sick 70-year-old uh, woman who is at the Ross Heart Hospital uh, across, the, across the way at OSU, and she had a 27-millimeter um, uh, Baxter mitral valve replacement, severe pulmonary hypertension. You can see all of her other things. She was class 4. She couldn't get out of the bed. And she was turned down for surgery. She was transferred to our lab just because we had some of the materials at that time to do the, the anticipated valve and valve. They had anticipated if she had got into trouble. And our anesthesia guys kind of, we did all this under conscious sedation. We, you know, you open the septum. We're going to have a whole session on this. But again, the Gillis sheath helped us go right through the valve and put your uh, Lundquist wire and the Melody valve uh, at, at that inside and of course there's lots of sapien and we'll talk I mean, that's going to be talked about as well later so this i wanted to kind of end with least favorite transeptal procedure and this is a, a patient that has um has been set up for transcatheter fontan there's a little marker right here it's a little sweet spot right here from the svc and you go right at least the way we did it you went right through there with your transeptal needle and uh how many know what wire fits through a transeptal needle what size wire Matt, you, you'll get to that. No. You need to know that. It's an 014, uh, and it's the only one that fits through the needle. And again, this is after the, the long covered stent was in place with the Fontan completion. But it started with the transeptal. So uh, learning and becoming skillful in transeptal techniques, it's mandatory in our world of congenital structural heart disease. You have to know the various equipment available and how to use each one. And remember, the, as Eric gave the title, you're the one that has to get there. So it, it's something you need to really hone your skills. It's not always easy, and you're not asked just to go across the atrial septum when you do transeptal puncture. Thank you. Uh -huh.